Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Hello, Tanya. I'm great. great. Julie, um, I haven't been I haven't been on Clubhouse in a while. <laughs> I haven't either, to be honest with you. So we'll see how we go. Um, I'm not attached to any sort of length. I just think this conversation is long overdue. Um, as far as we've just tried to reschedule this so many times, but the exciting thing is it landed on my nine month, uh, mark of being off alcohol. And that's pretty exciting. Um, I am still, yeah, I am still getting over COVID, uh, unfortunately, and talking a lot and breathing a lot can sometimes be a little troublesome. So if I mute myself, it might be because I'm hacking. So, um, Fine. but I really am excited to talk today with you. And I'm so glad that you uh, made some space and time to be here because um, I tried to talk about this on my own and no one came <laughs> into the room. So I thought it would be really good to share our experience um, since you're the one that inspired me to take Yay. the break. So, um, but yeah, I want to give you some space to introduce yourself, and I would love to hear for you what inspired you to take this break. And I kind of know your personal story, and also I just want to mention I put a link at the top here to a podcast that Allison and I did on her podcast um, back in November. So it was like when I was like maybe two months into this process. Um, so it'll be interesting to compare where I'm at now and where I was at that stage of this process. And I'm sure you've learned a lot uh, since then, because that was yep. November of 21. So I want to hear, like, are you drinking again? How does that feel? Um, I want to share some insights and observations, of course, being an HSP and being someone that is actively choosing not to drink. Um, and not just because a lot of HSPs are sensitive to alcohol, we're also sensitive to caffeine and mm -hmm. sugar and all these things. And so I feel like as a highly sensitive person, um, I've gone through these stages of eliminating different things to kind of see how I feel when I'm off these substances that could potentially be sabotaging me in whatever way, whether it's sleep or health or um, mood and all of that. So I'm just really interested to dig into this and see what your personal experience has been like. And um, we'll weave some of the HSP stuff in there as well. So uh, I'll just give you some space to introduce yourself, Allison. I know you have been on um, these rooms in this club before. Um, but yeah, you're not as active in Clubhouse. You're active everywhere else, but I'll <laughs> let you just take the spotlight here and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you for inviting me into this room today. It's fun. I feel like most of my Clubhouse experiences have been with you and it's the best. Yay! Um, so yeah, I'll, just a little, little bit about me. Um, I am... I live in Texas. I am turning 39 this year. I am a mom. I am a wife. I worked in the music industry for the past like 16 years. And that is something that ended when COVID began. That sort of all shut down. And then I, I leapt into um, the second part of my career, which is um, business coaching and human design coaching. And that's a whole other thing. But so much of this has brought up um, really like diving into human design. If you want to learn more about that, you can just connect with me on Instagram. I'll, I'll tell you all those things, but that's not really what this, this room is about. But diving into my human design was, and meeting Julie because of that, was when I really did realize that I am an HSP. Um, and I always knew that I was pretty sensitive, more sensitive than most people people in my life. Um, but I didn't realize how it was impacting me to keep living the same way that other, everybody else was, or that society can conditions you to live. And, um, it's been, it's almost like the past two or three years have been a, just, uh, I don't know, an intense time of personal growth and shedding and 
getting rid of things in my life that aren't good for me and, and all of those things. And I'm sure a lot of us had that over the past couple of years. So I have a, being, having a background in the music industry, I obviously, I mean, it was the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing for all of my twenties. Like that was just, that's how the music industry works. You're always out going to concerts and partying and all the things. And I mean, it was fun. I don't know. I mean, you know, I I try not to have regrets in my life, but there's a lot of stupid things that I did. And, um, just the way of life in that community and culture seemed so normal to be drinking all the time and, you know, like not just on weekends, but all throughout the week and going into work hungover. And it was like something we joked about and that was just quote unquote normal, but just, I'm learning so much that just because something is normal does not mean it's the best thing or the most uh, aligned thing for you or the, the best way that you can be living. So anyways, fast forward to, um, becoming a mom. I obviously didn't drink while I was pregnant and that's a little bit easier. Um, there was a few times that I had like half a glass of wine or something, but it's a lot easier for anybody who has had been pregnant. Um, cause you don't feel well and your hormones are off and you're like doing, you're not drinking for somebody else, obviously. So I don't really, I don't really quite count that. Um, so anyways, once I became a mom, um, I didn't drink a ton while breastfeeding, but then once I was weaning off, you know, life was crazy. That was when the pandemic had hit. We were all freaking out and stressed to the max and also bored a little bit, I think. And so I really turned to wine and whatever, just to like ease a little bit of tension at the end of the day. And it wasn't like I was drinking a whole bottle of wine. I wasn't even drinking that much, but because of the lack of sleep and the lack of energy and the way that my body chemistry had changed. I, even just one glass of wine made me feel like complete crap the next day. And there was a couple of different times in that year where I did drink a little too much and it just uh, taking care of a baby or any child hungover is like literally hell on earth. I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I had a friend who had quit drinking, I think in 2019, and it was just nuts to see the health journey that she went on, like the mental health improvement and physical health improvement. And I was like, I just have to do this. And honestly, I tried I tried to take like a whole month off, I think around May or June of 2020. And it didn't, like, I couldn't do it. I think there's so many, um, I don't know. I have a lot of issues around freedom and making rules on myself. I never had, like, um, what's it called? Uh, Eating disorders or anything like that. But I still, like, don't love making rules around myself. However, I was was reading a few books. I read the, oh, Julie, what what is the book I'm thinking about? women, like it's about women quitting drinking, uh, like quit like a woman. That's what it's called. I forget the author, but I read that book even while I was still sort of drinking here and there. And it was so profound to me because she talked about how sometimes there's more freedom in choosing not to drink than creating little rules for yourself. Like I'll just drink on the weekends or I'll just have one or blah, blah, blah. And so I was like, okay, let me like think about it in this way that I'm going to have more freedom just taking it off the plate. And I'm just, I think I started out like, so finally in November of 2020, I was like, I'm just going to do this through January. Like now, I think it was right before Thanksgiving. And I was like, I'm going to do it through January. I was having a lot of emotional turmoil just in my life and becoming a parent, like, marriage stuff was hard at that time. We were renovating a house and the pandemic and like everything. I was having a lot of emotional stuff. So every time I would drink, it was like pouring gasoline on that emotional fire. And my husband was like, what is going on with you? Like, you know, what's going on? So I was like, I just got to take this off the table. 
So I hadn't even planned on doing a whole year. Um, I think I chose like a hundred days or something to do at first. And then once I got to a hundred days, I was like, dude, I feel freaking amazing. Let me just go for a year. And I knew that I could do it. And it was almost like this little challenge to myself. Um, I think I got in my head a few times about like, oh my gosh, I like, part of me wants to do this forever and never drink again. And then part of me doesn't want to have those rules. Like if I ever go to Europe again, um, I want to be able to have some wine, blah, 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 like all the different things. But I just decided I was like, okay, so much of this stuff is, you know, in our head and it's like, okay, let me just not worry about what's going to happen beyond the year and just do this year. And I will tell you it was literally a miracle. Like I unpacked so many things. I learned about myself as an HSP and as a person who not only, um, I think numbed a lot, but our nervous systems as HSPs are so much more sensitive to so many more things than a lot of people. And I had to find the tools that worked for me other than alcohol so that I knew that I had a variety of tools. Sometimes it's not enough just to have one. Sometimes you need like 10 tools in your toolbox so that you can choose different things that work for you at that time and in that season of your life. And so if you want, I'm not going to go into all of those tools right now, but if you want to connect, I'm sure Julie has a lot of tools too, but if you want to connect about that over on Instagram, I can, I can talk to you about the different tools that I had other than alcohol, because I think that sometimes as HSPs, it is important certain times to know I do need to numb right now. Like I need to like do whatever is possible to keep myself from fight or flight. Right. And then sometimes it's like, okay, I just need to ground myself. Like they're, you know, it's very nuanced. They, they both sort of can sometimes look the same and sometimes look completely different. But I took that shame and guilt around the idea of numbing. And I was like, dude, right now in our world, like sometimes I need to numb. Sometimes I need to hermit. Sometimes I need to go and just shut out the freaking world so that I can get back to my center. And so, but the thing is with alcohol, choosing alcohol to numb, um, Yes, it numbs for a, a little bit. Honestly, only probably like 45 minutes to an hour. And I've I've realized this since I have drank again. Um, since I took a little bit over, over a year off of drinking and then started slowly introducing it back. And so there's been times that I've drank, but I've been very intentional about it. And I've realized with it how long it actually only makes you feel good and then it starts making you feel bad almost immediately and for sure like the next day. And the crazy thing about take it, and then I'll get off my little soapbox and Julie, you can ask me questions or share, share some of your experience. But the crazy thing about taking a whole year off, number one, it takes 10 days for alcohol to completely get out of your system. So if you haven't taken a 10 day break in a while or a little more than that, allow yourself like 14 days so that you at least get three days of like flying high and feeling really good. Um, but it takes 10 days for it to totally get out of your entire physical body. And most of us don't know what that feels like really. And knowing what that feels like, you start sleeping better. Your body regenerates cells better and faster. Your liver is like in love with you because it's not having to do extra work. Um, it's just, honestly crazy. So like taking a whole year off is even more amazing because your body's really, really able to catch up and you're really able to start unpacking some things for all the reasons that you do drink in the first place. And that was also one thing I noticed in being a part of like some, a few different sober communities and stuff like that. Um, and there's so much good stuff in the sober communities and support and, Um, normalizing things and all that kind of stuff. But I also just really, really don't view um, drinking or alcoholism as like this. I think it's, I think the drinking is always, always some sort of band-aid to what the real deep problem is. And I will tell you, even after taking a year off and then continuing still to like be very intentional 
about my relationship with alcohol, I still haven't unpacked all of those things. So it's probably going to require some future really long breaks to even unpack more things. It's almost like peeling an onion back and everything to get to where I know that never, ever again, will I use alcohol to numb? Cause there have been a few times in the past few months that I've used alcohol to numb. Um, but it hasn't been like habitual, like it was before. And I've been very intentional about it. And what's weird is the days where I use it to numb the next day, I feel really not good. And on the days where I use it as magnifying joy, that's already there. I don't feel like I drink the next day. It's, it's really, really a weird energetic thing that happens. It's crazy. So I'm still unpacking all of that kind of stuff. Um, but the taking the year off of alcohol, which I might do again in the future or three months at a time or one month at a time or whatever, um, is such a beautiful gift to give to yourself to just lower the, uh, lower any damage you're doing to your already sensitive body and give it a little bit of time to heal and a little bit of time to you for you to slowly and gently peel back any layers that might exist for you to find the reason that you're even drinking in the first place. So that was a lot, but that sort of all of that in a nutshell for me, Julie, do you have any questions? Well, I like that you brought up um, the fact that alcohol is a numbing tool. I think most of us are aware of that, even though we may still indulge. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that I think about when I reflect back to who I was as a young person. So like when I started drinking, obviously it was in college and then, you know, you're legally able to at age 21 and I didn't really drink too much in high school, um, but I definitely upped that in um, my college years. And I think back to different incidences where I would fully black out because I was that sensitive or I was not um, engaged with my internal nudges saying, you've had enough. I was easily influenced by my peers as a highly sensitive person. So I didn't really have that stop switch internally. And again, like you mentioned too, just the amount of stress and carrying the weight of the world as a highly sensitive person, not even knowing I was a highly sensitive person back then, um, it was definitely a way for me to almost put those blinders on and let go of all that thinking and all that feeling and all of the intensity of the world and just use alcohol as a way to lighten up. And I was one of those people when I would drink alcohol, I, I know there are people who respond differently to alcohol. For me personally, um, I never got angry or went into a dark place or did things that I didn't remember um, as, as far as like my behavior goes. So I never really had that um, relationship with alcohol. And just for me personally, going um, back to the pandemic, which is really where I was starting to notice my use of alcohol increase. And at that point through, you know, just um, age and the different health issues I was facing and being a highly sensitive person, I was no longer drinking beer just because I would feel bloated. I would feel really swollen. Um, I would, you know, I was trying to go through elimination diets and all that stuff. So I was really just drinking vodka. So I would get a bottle of vodka and basically drink through it until it was gone. It wasn't like, you know, we had anywhere to go. And I was actually one of those people during the pandemic where I was at home from March, 2020 through September. And I didn't go, I didn't leave the house to go to work. Um, schools were shut down. I was doing substitute teaching at the time. So I was actually getting paid to sit home, which was such a gift to get unemployment during that time. Um, and so it was really a boredom issue for me. And 
it wasn't like I was drinking that much uh, prior to the pandemic. And I was starting to see myself indulge a lot more. And it was just kind of one of those things where, you know, you go to the grocery store and you pick up your vodka and you pick up your lemonade. Like it was just a no brainer. I didn't think about it anymore. And then as I, September, 2020, I started to uh, do my work again. I started to have purpose and meaning again in my life. I wasn't just sitting around waiting for the next bad news. And that's kind of when Allison and I had connected through Amy Porterfield's uh, Digital Course Academy, and we were accountability buddies. And um, that was kind of a rebirth time for me. And as Allison um, had started her journey, I was witnessing that on Instagram. And I was like, wow, I'm like, she's really going for it. Like, she's doing this. And I was so impressed. And I'm type, I'm one of those people where I like to take on challenges that challenge myself versus being competitive. Um, so I just kind of thought, why not? Why not give it a try? It's like I've been drinking since I was 19. And I don't recall any of those years to age 46 is when I started this, that I've just taken a whole year off. Um, I haven't had a pregnancy, so I never had to give it up for that reason. So I just thought, why not challenge myself and see what happens? And one of the first things that happened for me was this trigger of noticing how much alcohol is accepted in our society and culture and how damaging it is. It is not good for our health. It has caused so many people pain and grief, whether they've been arrested, driving drunk, or they've even worse, uh, committed a crime or, you know, had a car accident that didn't end well. Um, and, and just there's serious consequences to alcohol, but it's so celebrated. It's like, oh, we, we teach people that if you're stressed, have a glass of wine. Or if you had a hard day, have a glass of gin and tonic, whatever. And I just, you know, even just when I would notice commercials and, you know, just TV shows and just how we're programmed to reach for alcohol as a solution to stress. And you also mentioned, Allison, in those joyous moments, like, so when we're celebrating something, it's very normal to have alcohol and how I have just kind of responded to different events in the last nine months and noticed, you know, okay, I am going to an event where there's alcohol involved, but why do I need to drink? Is there, um, you know, a benefit of just pulling back and not doing that, but still participating in the fun, being social, being connected, um, but just choosing to be alcohol free. And so that was like the huge challenge for me. However, I started my journey at the very tail end of summer. So I was going into those winter months where we're kind of less social or, you know, we're more at home. Um, so for me personally, that was why I started in late August because summer is the hardest time for me to let go of alcohol. And I don't know if that was an experience for you as well, but it's that time of season where you sit outside, you have a cold beer, you have a vodka lemonade, and it just, uh, enhances that positive experience. So, um, for me personally, I just think getting through this summer and having that the success of completing a year is um, I'm coming to the tail end of this experience and I'm fully committed to a full year. It hasn't been hard for me in the sense that, you know, I do stay at home a lot, so I'm not out as much in the world socializing and around those temptations, but I also don't feel so tempted. I think when I was able to, in the very beginning, recognize, oh, I'm reaching for a drink because I'm watching The Bachelor. Like, this is how ridiculous. Um, I'm influenced by viewing others um, having alcohol and how that makes me want to have some alcohol. Or when I was watching... Um, uh, something, it was like, 
buying houses in the Caribbean and they would always have like a cocktail. And I was like, oh, I want a pina colada. That sounds so good. So it's just like being that empath HSP who's easily influenced by these outer experiences, but then being able to pause in that moment and say, I don't really want it. I'm seeing it and I'm seeing that it looks fun and inviting. But ultimately, I was able to go to that checklist where I knew if I had alcohol, it would disrupt my sleep. It would make me crave foods that are supportive for my anti-inflammatory journey. It would make me feel like crap the next day. I would typically get like my hands would be so swollen from the sugar of the alcohol and I wouldn't really be able to bend my fingers very well. So those were the reasons why I kind of stepped away from it for health reasons, being health conscious and on this journey of um, being a highly sensitive person with food sensitivities, food intolerances. Um, it was just nice to pull back from this being my go-to, whether it was for stress or for enjoyment, for pleasure. So um, it hasn't been hard for me. Um, and I think once I just kind of got through a lot of those self-reflective experiences of like being angry at the world that, oh, why is alcohol the center of our attention in our society and culture? And kind of being mad about that to just saying, but I don't have to be mad. I can have a kombucha or I can have a mocktail or I can find a different way to connect without being angry. And I don't know if you had that experience at all, Allison. Were you ever like angry at our culture? Oh my gosh, yes. That was like a big trigger that I went through. And I think a little bit of what I needed to go through for my personal development, it's like very, it's like a, it's nuanced because like part of it is, you know, I see it very much like there's this whole mommy wine culture, you know, that's like really, really toxic um, where it's like mommy drinks because you wine. And it's like, oh, my God, what are we putting on our children for like putting this out there? There's freaking cups that say that at, you know, we were at Bass Pro Shops the other day, which is a whole other thing. We live in Texas. So <laughs> that's a thing. But um, I don't know. It's so it's just all conditioning. And this is me getting on my little dumb conspiracy theory, whatever soapbox. But like, I think there's some forces out there that sort of want the masses to just be numbed out and don't want us thinking for ourselves or thinking about big deal things that need to be solved, like our environmental issues. Um, there's just so many, so many things that I think might be like deeper topics to get into to why we are so fed this idea that alcohol is just normal and should be part of our everyday life. Uh, yeah, I got really angry about it. I still get angry about it, even like drinking here and there again. It's like, well, it's like, I can I like, we can't even catch a break. You can't go into Target without seeing 15 areas where there's wine sitting out there you know um i mean i don't even watch tv that has commercials on it like we don't have cable but like the amount of commercials that are out there the amount of billboards when you're driving through town that have different alcoholic beverages on there the fact that it's just included in every single holiday or event or whatever it's you know, I don't like, I don't ever like going to like victim mentality, but for so many, it's not our fault. Like we're being fed these things and you have, um, your own free will to figure out what works for you and to take yourself out of what's quote unquote normal and that, that whatever, what everybody else is doing. Uh, so yeah, I still have, that's something I'm like, working through is the triggers and anger and stuff around that. And there's also the, like, I get so, I sometimes have a hard time speaking to myself really well and not being hard on myself. I would never call myself a perfectionist, but sometimes I am just hard on myself. So I think the only way 
that I was ever going to have a different relationship with alcohol or no relationship with alcohol was to not judge myself or have hatred for myself of the times when I did partake or drink too much or the things I did because of it or whatever. Like you have, you can't truly, truly change until you accept you for you. Right. And I had to realize that I just, there were so many things in life that were like so hard to handle. And we're just taught that you numb it out in some way. Uh, it's so funny, Julie, that you mentioned the bachelor, because I think the first bachelor season that I watched after not drinking was Claire and she doesn't drink. And then they had, what's her name on there, who chose the guy who doesn't drink. He's like a sobriety coach or whatever. And I was like, oh, this is cool. So it was sort of like the universe was showing me, hey, you don't like, there are people out there who don't drink. So there was a lot less drinking on both of those. Or it was the same episode because Claire like found somebody and then they brought, what's her name in? I can't remember her name. Anyways, but after that, I tried to watch the next one and there was like a bunch of drinking again. And I was like, okay, I'm just not going to watch this anymore. I mean, it's in so many, I think I have like a list of shows that doesn't have a lot of drinking in it. And those were things that I watched during that time. I even go back, like I'm watching Seinfeld right now. And even going back to there, they hardly drink in that show. That was like in the early mid nineties. And it just wasn't as big of a, like, I think the only thing that people drank on, you saw cheers because they were at the bar, but nobody was like getting wasted or anything, but there weren't many other TV shows that had like regular drinking going on. And it's like, this is something that started in like the early two thousands almost. And I don't know what the deal was. It's just like big alcohol trying to sell more alcohol to us. I don't know. So anyways, I have like all these little theories <laughs> that I started thinking about on when I took my year off. And um, I still, I think I still have a lot of things to work through as far as triggers and anger and like, why is this going on and whatever. But maybe that was like wasting a bunch of energy and I should just be like, whatever, I can just opt out and let everything else go the way it is. But I think it's sad because I think, uh, you know, it is something that's conditioned into us from an early age. Like it's very, I didn't drink much in high school either, Julie, not until like a month before graduation. But then college is just like, oh my gosh, it's so normal. Like even before you turn 21, it's just so very normal to go get drunk all of the time and to binge drink and to, for it to be just a part of your weekly life, a part of your daily life. And I want that to like in raising my daughter, you know, I don't want to put a whole bunch of rules on her and everything, but I don't want her to see that as just the normal way of doing things growing up. I you know? totally agree. Yeah. And if you're, you know, trying to model that, in front of little eyes that are watching your every move. I mean, that's so huge. I mean, you're, you're definitely going to have an impact on her experience with alcohol because of this experience of take, removing it. Um, and you were talking about uh, college years. It's funny. I live in a college town and um, the fall in the weekends where there's football games here, this whole town revolves around football and drinking mm -hmm. and you can go around to the different um, yards or tailgating spots that are near the stadium. And there's literally a business of renting your property so that cars can park on, on your backyard or they have big parties and, you know, charge for, people to drink kegs and all that and the amount of garbage that is created like you literally go um the next day and you will see just plastic cups and just garbage like everywhere that's created from a bunch of drunk idiots who are wasting an entire day to drink and then go watch these like 19 to 21 year olds bash their heads and helmets that then have mental emotional issues or health issues um, as they get older because of 
you know, the sake of entertainment. And so that really gets me going. And because I'm in a university town, um, that is just in my face nonstop. And I remember I lived on a main road um, a few years back and it was cliche that every time we would have a football Saturday, there was an uptick in the amount of fire trucks and ambulances that would be going by. I even had a kid try to enter my house because he was so drunk and he was literally asking for um, a, a charger for his cell phone. I just, I couldn't believe it. And I'm sure he was completely not even aware of what he was doing. So it's just interesting to also have that perspective of not drinking and then watching drunk people make a fool of themselves. And obviously not everyone that drinks goes over their limit. I even, when I was drinking before the pandemic, my limit was like two drinks. Like I'd have one or two beers and I was good. You know, I'd have that little buzz before I would have my meal. And then once I had food, I really wasn't interested in continuing to drink because I was full. And a lot of times beer would just make me feel even more bloated. So it's just really interesting to watch the behavior of people who drink um, and that idea that it's so accepted. And it's like you said, there's so many messages out there that say, reach for a drink. And I agree with you a thousand percent that it is a way to control society and just like tv and processed food and all these things that kind of numb us out to doing something a little more productive or something more healthy for ourselves and i know you had mentioned in the beginning of our conversation that you discovered different tools that were more helpful for you instead of drinking so i would love to get into that what um, things came to you through that process of your first year off of alcohol? Yeah, one of the main things was I realized I was over caffeinating myself, um, which when you have too many uppers um, and too much caffeine, you tend to reach for something to bring you back down at the end of the day. And so I took coffee out. And the weird thing is, is that so much of the issue with coffee is a lot of times like the type of coffee and um, the acidity that then affects you and makes you almost get more jittery. It's not necessarily just the caffeine. So I switched to this stuff called King Coffee. It has um, not like magic mushrooms, but like mushrooms that are very calming and grounding in there with the caffeine like it's actual coffee with caffeine so it tastes like coffee because i love the taste of coffee um and i started drinking that and it literally healed my adrenals i think one of the main reasons i drink like normal like daily was just because my adrenals were shot and i needed to like have something to like calm me down um another thing it's not like a product but it's just like saying no and not hanging out with people I didn't want to hang out with. So many times I drank because I was like, I'm very introverted and have social anxiety. And I was putting myself in social situations that I didn't want to be in in the first place. And so drinking helped to sort of ease me into that. And instead I was just like, Hey, I'm not going to go hang out with this person that I don't, if I can't hang out with somebody and have fun without drinking with them, the, do they need to be in my life? Like, do I need to be hanging out with them? Okay. Stop hanging out with them. <laughs> um, and then, um, there's this, there's this, uh, sort, it's not like a protein powder, but it's called earth broth. It also has like I think they're reishi mushrooms, totally legal, uh, awesome stuff, but it's this broth that's very grounding and it's almost makes you feel like you have had like a glass of wine. There's no alcohol in it or anything. There's a lot of also, um, new alcohol, like alcohol free liquors that are like adaptogens and have nootropics in them that help just chill you out a little bit without alcohol. And they're really, really great. My, one of my good guy friends, um, that lives in Austin has one called Tennyson and I really, really love it. It's almost like a, 
I mean, it looks like it's a whiskey or something, but it's not. Um, and it's just really grounding and gives, leaves you feeling really chill and nice. Um, and it's just also nice to have, like, be able to pour something into a wine glass or something, um, you know, with some ginger beer that doesn't have alcohol in it and, and just have like something to sip on so many, I mean, people who smoke talk about this, that it's a lot of times an oral thing, like an oral fixation where you're wanting to just put something in your mouth. So I, I drank so much Topo Chico. Um, I know how to make really good mocktails. I think that treating yourself and making mocktails is really, really awesome. Um, I did all this, is this varies state to state, but I did also utilize Delta eight. It's a type of, um, THC like strain that's legal in lots of places. So there's just like a really small amount of it. And this is different for everybody, but for me, that was very nice and grounding and very much, um, not like, a. I don't know, not, there's no out of control feeling. I slept really good and it was almost like I could still work. Um, if I, but if I was having like a anxiety attack or panic attack or feeling just very overwhelmed, it was something that grounded me a little bit. Um, and then one of my favorite people to follow, if y'all want to get some info on this, my friend Bijou, her Instagram handle is mushroom mamacita. And she talks all about the wonderful benefits of mushrooms, all types legal and non-legal. So that's a whole other thing. Um, but she, there's a lot of resources there for things that really help rewire your brain, um, and get out of the, that, any habitual, um, habitual thoughts or emotions or traumatic things that are still affecting you that make you need to reach for that drink. So it's actually like, not putting a band-aid on it. Like I feel like the Delta eight probably is putting a band-aid on it, but that I didn't judge myself for that. Um, cause I knew that it wasn't affecting my body in a bad way, like alcohol was, but it, as far as like the, any type of medicinal mushroom stuff, legal or, or depending on where you live, um, there's little supplements and things like that, but that can help in brain rewiring where you're actually going to the root of why you would drink or want to numb in the first place, which is a very important place to get to is, is not putting a bandaid on it and actually going to the root causes of all of these things. But for me, I think it was so much of being an introvert and honoring that being an HSP and honoring that, um, healing my adrenals with better, you know, coffee products and, um, just being super aware and knowing the tools to numb or ground if I need to, that were available to me that weren't alcohol. Cause alcohol, it does the job in numbing for a little bit, like literally only for an hour. And then beyond that, you're not getting more and more numb. You're just then creating more, um, I mean, you're bringing more toxins into your body that your body is then going to have to detox from and in that detox actually more anxiety is created so it's weird alcohol actually creates anxiety which we always use it to lower anxiety and it lowers it for just a little bit and then it'll create it more for the next like 10 days in your body which is so crazy (laughs) yeah it's interesting because for me I I definitely noticed the times where I were, I was having some sort of feelings, uh, whether I was feeling angry or upset or frustrated or disappointed. And those were the feelings that would say, oh, well, alcohol will solve that, you know? And so it's really given me time to sit with my feelings and find different ways to process my feelings. And obviously as an HSP, I have a lot of feelings and I process them deeply and I process them longer. And so it was, it's just been a gift for me to kind of find what are alternative ways to uh, be with my feelings and using different substances really wasn't an option for me. I'm also um, removing coffee from my diet. Uh, this is something I've done on and off, um, for different reasons. Um, I really struggled with this spring. 
Um, in Iowa, we have had really cold weather. Even now, it's like maybe 60 degrees out and kind of drizzling. And when it's cold, I just crave the comfort of hot coffee. And so it's been lingering, um, my coffee habit, but I, I did give it up for a while. And then the the spring just didn't come. We didn't have warm weather. And, and so it was harder for me to stay off of it because I really, I switched to matcha, which is a better uh, caffeine because it doesn't give you those big spikes. It really is like a slow up and a slow down. Um, so you, you aren't as impacted, um, by all of the, the spikes that coffee can give you and it doesn't drain your energy. And there are so many wonderful nutritious, um, parts to matcha. Um, so there are some benefits to just drinking green tea. Um, but it was just one of those things when that ran out, I was like, okay, I'm just not going to have anything in the morning. And it ran out and it was still cold out. So I switched to coffee again. And so I've been on hooked on that, but also um, going back to substitute teaching, it's a little hard to have a sleepless night and then go in and sub without some sort of stimulant. So um, I am done subbing at the end of this week, and then I will be doing a huge overhaul in June um, the second week of June, which I've been in the process of doing uh, since April. And then at the beginning of May, after doing a full month of nothing but whole foods, a lot of um, meat and vegetables, um, just moving away from processed food, moving away from coffee, obviously not uh, drinking alcohol. Um, I started to go even a little deeper in May and was going to remove uh, dairy and gluten. And then on May 5th, I was diagnosed with COVID. Um, so that has kind of um, taken me away from my original plan, but I will get back on that um, starting in June. And it feels really good uh, to know that I don't have to give up alcohol as part of this journey, that that is something I've already been doing. So it's not, it doesn't feel hard to me right now because there are other things that I need to focus on and let go of that will be harder for me. Um, so it's just been interesting kind of witnessing those feelings and those emotions that I would maybe be, be uh, numbing out with alcohol and just being with those feelings. I feel like I journal more. I feel like I am finding comfort in friends that don't drink a lot. Um, it's also weird how <laughs> I subscribe to Medium and I started getting all these articles that were about celebrities who don't drink. And I was fascinated by the number of celebrities who do not drink alcohol. And it also inspired me to just think, you know, we're really being brainwashed to think that alcohol is something that we need in our lives or that we need to um, process those stressful moments or even those celebratory moments. Um, and I find that when I get sunshine, that is really important for me. When I have time in nature, when I am getting really good sleep, when I'm taking a lot of time out for rest, you know, these are the things that give space and time for my feelings and emotions to be processed without having to race to a substance to kind of stuff down those feelings and emotions. So that's been a huge wake up call for me. And to really process those emotions and feelings in a healthy way versus using alcohol has been something that has been playful for me. It's not been a burden or heavy or upsetting um, that I'm not able to go to alcohol. Um, it's just made me be more curious and more creative about what I can do and to look at those feelings as just indicators of, you know, what I need to work on and being okay with, again, feeling like, I don't belong or I'm doing it different or I'm not like everyone else and having to explain to others if I'm not drinking, no, I'm not pregnant or, 
you know, just those assumptions that people make. Um, and I think it's just, it's fun being that person that can still enjoy an experience, but not need alcohol to do it. So that's been a huge wake up call for me and just exploring what it feels like to not be drinking and how I'm dealing with my feelings and emotions um, when they come up. I love that. And I think that it's, I honestly do think that we're starting to experience a shift. I don't know if y'all have seen, but there's a lot more sober curious talks going on out there. Um, there's a lot, there's, I mean, there's, um, in Austin, we have this bar called Sands Bar. There's all these alcohol-free bars popping up where they just serve mocktails for people to go to, to like have community people who don't drink. Um, I think it's a conversation that's just growing. And so I think that it is something that is going to take on over the next few years. I'm, I'm, my podcast is called You Do Woo. Y'all see that? So I'm very woo-woo. Um, but there's definitely a global cycle shift that's going on that actually started in 2020 and is finalizing in 2027. And I think this looking at alcohol is going to be one big, one big part of it. And um, deconditioning from alcohol being normal in everyday life. And we just need people to step up and start these conversations, even if it's just sober curious, it doesn't have to be hundred percent sober. Um, just sober curious, take a look at it, take a look with your, at your relationship with alcohol and start making decisions. Like I used to post on my Instagram stories all the time, like me with a glass of wine or me at happy hour with friends and da da da. And I'm just much more aware of like, Hey, I shouldn't post this and put this out into the ether because somebody who's trying to maybe take a break from alcohol could see this and get triggered by it and be like, well, I want to go have a glass of champagne, you know? So it's just being a lot more intentional and aware of our actions, of the, con of things we're conditioning other people to think and feel. And then also putting, putting barriers up and putting boundaries around our own um, self and our own energy field so that we are not affected by that external conditioning and know that we have um, autonomy and our own authority and free will to create the physical environment and body that we want to have. So, well, and I also want to say like me taking a break from alcohol doesn't mean I'm looking at everyone who's drinking as your doing it wrong or I'm judging you for drinking still because I think that is something that I felt um, when I would notice different people around me who chose not to drink. I felt very judged. I felt like, oh, I don't have an alcohol problem so I can continue to drink and enjoy it when I enjoy it. And so I think it's important to have weaved in the conversation that it's not so much about a judgment on yourself or because of alcohol being used by our society, but really just taking a look at when we remove these substances, what does that create? What experience do we have with, you know, without alcohol? And so it's really just about being curious and getting clarity and just being able to make decisions and have reflections without alcohol, I think is really part of this path that I would encourage anyone to take. Um, not because I think you have a problem with alcohol, but because it is something that is so accepted. But why do we accept it? Why are we conditioned to think this way that this is what we do because it's social or we handle stress this way? How else can we handle stress? How else can we be social? And one of the things that I really got into was, you know, in reframing this for myself, instead of feeling like, oh, I feel like I have to give something up, I, th I thought of like, well, what can I add in? What can I experiment, whether it's mocktails or kombucha or different teas or just to kind of open up my world to something beyond alcohol, because there's other creative ways to enjoy, you know, a refreshing drink that isn't alcoholic. So 
that's definitely been part of my process as well. Um, sorry, there's someone cutting grass next door to me, so I'm trying to walk away from it. But yeah, I, I wanted to also quickly read the chat comments. Um, I always forget about them, so I'm going to read them really quick. So Shannon said, I was never a big drinker. I have not had alcohol in six years this June. Congratulations, Shannon. I stopped due to medication and was told I could occasionally have a drink here and there, but made the decision to stop. I don't really miss it that much, to be honest. Um, that's awesome. I feel like you're in good company because I really don't miss it much either. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I made some poor decisions when drinking that I am not proud of. I took more risks and am lucky that nothing bad happened to me. I can relate to that as well, Shannon, because I definitely did stupid stuff in my early 20s um, because of alcohol. Um, someone was definitely looking out for me. Yes. Um, and Tanya said, King Coffee is amazing. I hadn't heard of King Coffee, so I'm going to have to look at that. I too love a warm drink and I recently switched to Dandy Blend, tastes very similar to coffee. I was on, God, I can't think of the name of it right now, but it's an herbal coffee that you can get and it's in a tea bag form and it's a coffee alternative to Chino. That's what it was called. Um, and I really enjoyed that, but it doesn't really taste like coffee. It, it does have like its own kind of unique flavor. Um, and I totally agree with this statement. Tanya shared the majority of coffee is infested with mold. That is true. Um, and then Muhammad, any advice on how I can be less judgmental and more helpful to a spouse dependent on alcohol? I appreciate any feedback on that whenever possible. So those are some um, experiences that were shared in the comments. Um, do you have anything that you would like to respond on that, Allison? Yeah, for Muhammad, um, the book called Codependent No More is freaking magical. Uh, and it doesn't have to do just with alcohol. It's anything like if you have relationships where you're worried about the other person in one way or another and you want them to change in one way or another, you got to read that book. It's, it's just magical. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I'm still working on that in lots of areas. My husband hardly drinks. Um, so it was actually, he was great. He took a lot of the year off with me and he can always just sort of take or leave alcohol. So that wasn't the situation with me, but I have a lot of codependency with a lot of other stuff um, with him and other relationships. And that is codependency by definition, and it will help with that relationship and everything else in life. It's so good. Julie, have you read that book yet? I haven't. Um, I'm going to have to take notes. Yeah. I, um, I was just going to say to Muhammad, I think when we put a lot of judgment on others in terms of, you know, we're seeing a habit that isn't it necessarily health health healthy or helpful for them it's a good time for us to reflect on where we might be doing the same because our judgments that we project outward usually indicate um the judgments that we have of ourselves so a lot of times when we feel the need to control others or judge others or, you know, basically wish their habits were different, um, we're doing that to ourselves as well. And so it might be a time to kind of look inward and see where you might be doing the same, but maybe not with alcohol. Um, and I think that will kind of create a healing experience, which will help you be more compassionate for your partner. And if your partner is struggling with alcohol, and it's not helpful in their life, um, I think it's really important to get support from a third party. Someone that can give perspective that isn't coming from your partner is really helpful. Um, and sometimes people just need a wake up call. Maybe they just need a friend that says, I'm really concerned about your alcohol use. Are you okay? Do you need support? What does support look like for you? Because 
we can't understand why people do what they do. And there might be a deep rooted cause or there could be trauma. And a lot of that stuff isn't our job to fix or, you know, even be with that that person may need some deeper support. So I just wanted to mention that as well. And I also, I mean, I don't know if your partner is open to this, but I also have a little um, mini course that's like a 10 day break from alcohol course. And I even let people walk through it, even if they're still drinking, um, just because it's helpful in just gaining knowledge and sort of taking a look at your relationship. Um, so feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or, or have your partner reach out to me on Instagram. Cause it's a, it's a fun and informative little course that just sort of helps you to, um, take a look at your relationship with alcohol, whatever that might look like. And then I have a ton of resources in there to either cut back on drinking or, um, take a break or take it out of your life completely or whatever. But I totally agree, Julie. I think every anything that bothers us in the outside world or with another human being is always shadow work. It's always some kind of characteristic that we have or that we're scared we could have or that we hate. And it's important to process through that and say, the reason this is bothering me is because it's an aspect of me that's inside of me that I've been in the past that maybe you were in like a past life or through trauma or something like that. And it scares me and I fear it and I need to bring it out into the light and out of the shadow and, and take a look at this. And no one ever changes, uh, out of guilt or shame. So just know that too. Um, the only way people ever change is knowing that they're okay, how they are right now and they're loved how they are right right now and then showing that there are better ways to feel and live and and um, be in in everyday life. I love that. That's a really important message that people aren't going to change um, when you shame them or, you know, that is huge. I think healing works from a loving, safe space. So we have to create that to really make big changes. So um, that's really important. Um, I just wanted to note we are about an hour in um, and I didn't know if anyone in the audience would like to come up and uh, share any reflections or share your experience with alcohol. Um, obviously, Alice and I could talk about this subject forever, but I wanna give a little space and time if anyone in the audience is interested in coming up you just click on where is the hand raising oh my gosh it's been a while since i've been in here um yeah um you can raise your hand and come on to stage if you have anything to share and if not allison and i can keep going here for a little bit longer um but i just wanted to give that opportunity and i guess it's now a little clipboard um that you can click on on the bottom right that's the hand raising and if we just have listeners that's totally cool um, i know not everyone is in a space to come up on stage and speak um, i really appreciate everyone listening and tuning in and being a part of the conversation even as a listener um, is there anything that you would like to mention to kind of wrap up here, Allison? Um, I think we covered so many awesome things. Um, I really do feel like so much of the magic in life comes from making decisions with our intuition. And I think that alcohol blocks that ability to access our intuition and to access that higher self that we all have inside of us. And so um, I always encourage everybody to just take two weeks. And if you want to do more, that's fine. But like take two weeks at a time often, um, just off so that you can access that higher self and that intuition because so many issues in your life can be worked through and um created into more beautiful things when you are making decisions 
from your intuition instead of just what everybody else is doing or what everybody else tells you you should do or <laughs> what your anxiety is telling you or your fear is telling you. Um, and I think that was probably the most beautiful part of my break from alcohol is being able to really access that spot for a whole year and know that I have the control to always go back to that clear headedness and that, that having that access. I think that's a really good point. Um, I think for HSPs, having a connection with our inner guidance system is the number way to be an empowered HSP. And I think when you're numbing through alcohol, you're not able to make that connection. It disrupts the connection. Um, and, you know, like you said, you were given yourself a year to really start to develop that within yourself and connect with that intuition on a regular basis. So I think that's a really important, um, observation coming from an HSP and how um, we can just build that uh, relationship with our inner guidance system and trust ourselves um, that our intuition is the key for, you know, tapping into that inner wisdom and the things that we know we know and um, believing ourselves, trusting ourselves. Uh, that is I think huge for HSPs to foster and grow. And um, I definitely don't miss drinking. I think about it for the summer season as like, oh, it'd be fun to sit on the porch and have a drink. But I also have other go-tos now, like having kombucha. And like you said, you can have it in a fancy glass. It feels a little more special. Um, but I don't even really need that. I just actually have the satisfaction of knowing that I'm not putting something in my body that is causing inflammation, that is causing me to crave foods that I really shouldn't be eating, um, and knowing it's not going to disrupt my sleep and it's not going to make me feel lethargic and, um, just more in an anxiety mode the next day, because that definitely was the case for me as well. And just kind of also as an HSP that processes a lot of thoughts and feelings, I can get stuck in those days after, after alcohol of like thinking negative thoughts and kind of spinning on those negative thoughts because of the alcohol. I mean, it's a depressant. So that's where it kind of takes my mind and my mood. So that's been a huge gift. So will I drink after a year? I don't know. I might say I'm done. Maybe I'll be like Shannon where it's like, I really don't miss it and I don't really need to go back to it. Or maybe I'll have an experience that's positive and I'll think that was great, but I don't need to continue to do it all the time. So I'll see where it takes me. But um, I really didn't have a problem with fully committing to a year just to say that I took a whole year off. Um, and so for me, it's just a no brainer to keep going until August 24th. That'll be my one year of being alcohol free. So that's um, really all I have to share about this topic. And if there is um, someone that is listening to this or listens to this as a replay, just know that you can reach out to Allison or I if you want to share your experience, if you want feedback on what to do or how to go about it. I am also a believer of taking on habit changes in small doses. So giving yourself two weeks free from it is like the first step. Um, like Allison said, it takes 10 days for that alcohol to really um, move out of your system. And then I always like 30 days and then I like 100 days. So I actually put those milestones in my calendar as a future commitment that I would hit 30 days, 100 days. Um, 
and then as I approached those days, it was something to celebrate. So that was pretty exciting. So kind of giving yourself that game. It's a game and I'm going to hit these different milestones. Um, as you get going, I think it's easier to just start small and simple. And, you know, I think journaling is really helpful through the process. Having a friend that doesn't drink and being able to share that experience, like I would message Allison through this experience and say, oh, it's been two months. And it was so nice to get her feedback. And she would always you know, just have wonderful compliments and say she was proud of me. So just having that accountability with someone, I think is really important if you want to make this change. But um, yeah, you might realize that you don't really miss it. <laughs> and I think that's a wonderful gift. And I think too, with age, I'm 46. Um, you know, were we meant to drink the whole time, like from age 21 or even sooner? Is that the way that life is supposed to work? We're just always drinking alcohol till we die. Um, I want to live um, a long, healthy life. I don't want to get to the point where I'm so deteriorated that my quality of life is suffering. So for me, if I ever would go to Japan, I would want to drink sake. Or if I go to Greece, I would, you know, like I'm okay having those experiences that um, alcohol is a part of, but I don't need to have it in my life every day. That's kind of been my own conclusion to just being nine months in. I love that so much. Um, yeah, my, fi my final little thing I'll, I'll say today is I ran into a friend, I think it's in her 50s, the other day at a kid's birthday party. And I didn't know that she had, she had been listening to my podcast of talking about my one year off of alcohol. And I don't even know that I saw her during my one year off of alcohol. But anyway, she was like, Alison, I'm 30 days in because of you. And it was crazy because I was going to ask her what she did differently. I'm like, did you get a facelift? Like what just ha what happened? Cause she was glowing and she was like full of energy. Um, everybody else at that party was drinking. She wasn't drinking. And she just was like, so magnetic and had, like vibrance about her. And she was 30 days in and she was like, I'm doing till my, um, I'm taking off alcohol until my, whatever her 55th birthday, which is in July. And she was like, and then I'm just going to see where I go from there. But I just wanted to thank you. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. I was like, it just feels good to have, there's a ripple effect. So just know that you taking some time and talking about it and starting these conversations and um, putting it out there in, in the ether is affecting other people, even if it's just one person at a time. So thank you so much, Julie, for having me in this room today. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I couldn't agree with you more. Just planting the seed and normalizing, um, taking a break from alcohol, I think is so important because I think it just can push that one person over into that decision of I'm going to do that, whether it's for two weeks, 30 days, 100 days, a full year or more. I think, um, you know, there isn't any great nutritional value to alcohol. And so for someone who's health conscious, it was a no brainer that it wasn't contributing to anything other than, you know, some, some good times, very short window of that. So I think uh, taking a break from anything that we do excessively is always going to offer us clarity. It's going to give us time to reflect on why we have those habits in the first place. And I think as uh, someone who is always pushing myself to do better, be better, um, I want to find pathways that feel good and make me feel good. And so moving, removing alcohol was definitely one of those things for me that um, just allowed me to feel less burden by that substance. So it's been a huge benefit for me. So thank you again for being here, Allison. And I think if anyone is interested and you're hearing this recording in the future, please uh, contact Allison. She has a great course about getting started with this process if you're interested. Um, and uh, you can also check out the podcast that I have up on the top linked 
to just talk about um, a different conversation when I was about two months in. So uh, there are resources out there and you'll start to see when you start to move away from alcohol, all the people that don't drink and haven't been drinking. And that's always eye opening as well. It's just how normalized we make drinking, but how um, a lot of people have made it normal to not drink. And so there's that side of the coin as well. So that's really all I have to share for today. And um, thanks, Allison, for being here. I'm so glad we finally got this conversation in. It's taken a, a while to get here, but I think it's so fitting that it happened to land on my nine-month date to the day of uh, being off alcohol. So it's um, a celebration and just having this conversation. So thank you. It was perfect timing. Happy nine months to you. And thank you so much for having me in this room. And it was great to chat with all of y'all today. Thanks, Allison. We'll see you next time. And if um, you are in the room here, um, just know the HSP Club will be taking a summer break. I am pulling back from a lot of responsibilities. Um, I've had just um, a really crazy start to 2022. Uh, between returning to subbing and juggling a lot of things and managing chronic health issues. Um, I just thought it would be really nice to take the summer off and start to explore more uh, life offline and getting back into art projects and spending time in nature and kind of taking care of that inner child within me that just wants to play and have a big break over the summer. So we won't be having clubhouse rooms. I may pop in here. Who knows? Um, I'm not making any hard, fast rules around it, but I am removing the obligation of being here on a weekly basis. And I know that this time will give me space to kind of reflect on all that I've been doing in the last year and a half on clubhouse and uh, reaching out to some people that I have connected with um, on this platform and then coming back in the fall to do whatever um, I decide to do, because that is to be determined. Um, so if you are um, missing us at all, just know there are plenty of replays um, here in Clubhouse. I also have them housed on YouTube, so you can listen to them like a podcast. And if you want to stay connected and you're not already on my uh, email newsletter, please reach out and I'll send you a link for that. Um, I will be sending out emails, but I just don't know how often over the summer. So I just want to give you guys a rundown on that. So thanks again for being here, everyone. It was great seeing you. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you next time.